Well, good evening. Um, I'm John Lettman, and I'm the chair of the uh, Town of Rockingham Historic Preservation Commission, and certainly want to extend a warm welcome to everybody who has joined us for this evening's presentation, The Great Falls and the Abenaki Sense of Place. This is the second lecture in a History Talks 2022 series that's uh, been sponsored by the Rockingham Historic Preservation Commission uh, with the invaluable collaboration of the Rockingham Free Public Library. This evening's speaker is Rich Holshue, who will lead a conversation around the significance of Abenaki relationship with place. His talk will focus on an Abenaki cultural worldview and its lasting implications while referencing a local site with deep historic roots. Kitsi Pontoguk, the Great Falls in present day, on present day maps, Bells Falls. Rich is a resident of Wantastaguk, seen on modern maps as Brattleboro, Vermont, <laughs> and an independent historic and cultural researcher. He has served on the Vermont Commission on Native American Affairs and is a public liaison and tribal historic preservation officer for the Ainu Abnaki, members of the contemporary indigenous community. He is a founder of the Otowi Project, a collaboration between the Elnu and with the retreat farm centered upon Wantastaguk um, Miskudal, I believe I'm pronouncing that somewhere near correctly, the West, West River Meadows, providing a place-based center to engage with the broader community while enhancing capacity and creating awareness for future dialogue. His work draws upon indigenous history, linguistics, geography, and culture to share beneficial ways of seeing and being in relationship with place. A few housekeeping items. Um, first of all, please see to it that you are muted. This keeps background noise down to a minimum. Um, at the end of the talk, we will have time for questions and hopefully some really robust conversation. Uh, please be aware that this evening's conversation is being recorded. I think you'll see an indication of that on your screen and will be available through YouTube for future viewing. And please be aware that a closed caption um, uh, captioning is, uh, is available uh, by pushing live transcript and the transcript and the appropriate uh, uh, further clicks from there if you wish to use it. Um, I have already acknowledged and again want to acknowledge our partnership with the Rockingham Free Public Library, particularly thanking librarians Ann Dempsey and Sam Mas Maskell for their ongoing help with this History Talks 2022 series. This is made possible in part through funding from the Vermont Division for Historic Preservation and the National Park Service. With that, please join me in welcoming Rich Holshue. Wuli Wani, John, Kwai Nidombak. Can everyone hear me? Give me a thumbs up. Okay, Wuli Wuni. Uh, I would like to introduce myself tonight to you in the language of the land here. I am a student, uh, but it is important to know these words. And Delewizi, Li Sal, Tindai Wantastigak, Tali Sukakik, Pakwanonguzian, Nuigo Dam Namiolan, Pamlongquik. I am called Rich and I am of what you know as Brattleboro, today known as, today known as Brattleboro, but traditionally known as Wantastagok. 
in the Sokoki country, Sukwakik, which is a part of the Abenaki nation. I am a citizen of Elnu Abenaki tribe here in southeastern Vermont and director of the Atui Project, which is a nonprofit dedicated to education and awareness raising around indigenous people in the larger community today. We are in partnership with Retreat Farm down here in Brattleboro. And uh, you can find us online at atui.org. And uh, I have a very good colleague in the person of Melody Walker Mackin. There's two of us doing this work. And this is a part of it, reaching out to you folks so that we can all learn together. Um, I'm going to sort of start with the, the big picture view and then come right down to uh, the ground here at uh, the Great Falls, Kitsi Pontagoc, you know it as Bellows Falls, on the Quinnitook, the Connecticut River, and we're going to get into this story. So I'm going to share my screen now. So here we are, Ndai Yodali. Great Falls and an Abenaki relationship with place. This is in partnership with the Rockingham Historic Commission and Rockingham Free Public Library, as John ably explained tonight. I am not going to make any assumptions. I'm going to start at the beginning so that we all are all on the same page. You may have heard the word Abenaki. You may have heard the word Abenaki. You may have heard the word Abenaki if you're in Vermont. You may have even heard the word Abernaki if you're in Vermont. These are all the same thing. Depends who you are and where you're from. We're talking about the original people of this place. So let's start a long time ago. The geology of Vermont goes way, way back. At the spine of the Green Mountains, there are uh, bedrock formations that are a billion years old. That's a long time ago. We're not going to start that far back. We're going to start with the Wisconsin ice sheet, which covered this area about 14,000 years before present. I'm going to use round numbers here so that we don't get into the weeds. But uh, this area was under ice of a mile thickness, the last ice age that passed through this area and created the landscape we see now. So this is the setting for this story. This is an, this uh, glacier that you see before you in the picture is from Greenland, but it is much like this place would have looked 14,000 years ago. Ice, water, rock, that was it. After the ice began to melt, there was a lot of meltwater filling the valley. Uh, we were under a couple hundred feet of water, very cold water, nothing living in it at the time, 13,000 years ago. Glacial Lake Hitchcock filled this valley from Rocky Hill, Connecticut, all the way to St. Johnsbury. That's a lot of water, no fish in it, it was cold. Nothing was living here at the time because the glacier had removed it all. But that began to change because life has a will. It began to change in our case, most notably with the presence of human beings. Only shortly after that ice melted and the lake began to recede eventually, Human beings were present here. Over in Keene, New Hampshire at the Tennant Swamp site, Dr. Bob Goodby, in the process of doing an archeological survey for the Keene Middle School construction project, not too many years ago, uncovered uh, a hab habitation site for native people. What uh, archeologists would term paleo people they were, there were four uh, shelters 
um, that were located here, just needle in a haystack at the edge of the Ashwillet River in what is now a swamp. These people were here hunting megafauna, um, living in their homes, doing human being things. And that's a long time ago. This is, this is the oldest uh, occupation site in Northern New England. And it's right in our backyard. This is an illustration by Miranda Nelkin, who is uh, art teacher at, middle, at Keene Middle School for the cover of Bob Goodby's recently issued book, A Deep Presence, which I highly recommend. It describes um, the indigenous relationship with this place since those times. Now the indigenous people of what is now Vermont, most of Vermont, New Hampshire, Southern Quebec, Western Maine, and Northern Massachusetts are called the Abenaki or Abenaki in congregate. That is a large umbrella term that covers many, many different bands of people organized by kinship by family and each centered on a particular place. Uh, cultures are not static, they change over time. Way back when, when this picture uh, is intended to depict 12,600 years ago, the people were living in tundra and their cultural um, habits would resemble much like the people who are in the Northern regions today that changed over time as the climate changed, the people changed, the resources changed, and the face of the landscape changed. The Abenaki people consider themselves to be the descendants of those original people. In their eyes and their minds and their hearts, they have always been here. In their language, Askami, Kizi, Indalo Dibana Yodali, we have always been here. Asqua, Indalo Dibana, Yodali, we are still here. Askami, Indalo Dibana, Si, Yodali, we will always be here. Now I'm going to get into, excuse me, <clears throat> um, exploring the idea of indigeneity and relationship to place. If you look it up in the dictionary, indigeneity is simply defined as the original people of a place, people in place. It is both equally, the two together, not separated. It is not reductive, the process of breaking things down into pieces. It is not a dualism where we look at binaries, one thing over here and one over there. This is a holistic concept, a holism. They, they are together, inseparable. The people are the land and the land is the people and they often share the same name. The word Abenaki is derived from this place, this area. Abenaki or Abenaki comes from the original word in the language, Wompanaki. You can see the similarity there. This is a compounding language. We take small words and we put them together to make a larger concept. First word in the in here, excuse me, is uh, womban, which indicates light or white or dawn. You can see that these are all forms of the same thing. And the second word is aki, which means earth or land. Put them together and you have womban aki. And that means the dawn land. This is where we are. There are many people who are amongst the Wabanaki or the Wombanaki. They are all in the northeastern corner of this continent where the sun first strikes the land. We are in the dawn land. And so the people of this place, the people of the dawn land are also called the Abenaki or the Wombanaki. This is a name that is applied to them by their neighbors originally. And so in today's usage, it has stuck as the label for the people in this area. We have to remember that different people look at things in different ways. 
And so there can be different terms for the same thing, depending on who's saying it and how they're looking at it. The Abenaki people call themselves, however, the word at the bottom, the Alnomba, which simply means an ordinary human being. They are the people. And you will know that, you will perhaps know that many indigenous people use this same phrasing for themselves. We are the people. This particular area where we are, coming home here, is the land of the Sokoki Abenaki people. The people in this Connecticut River Valley from about the town of Montague in Massachusetts at the Great Falls there, northward up the valley to um, points, points north, um, perhaps all the way up the valley. And so that term used today is Sokoki. It comes from the French term, Sokoki, which comes from the original word in the Abenaki language, Sukwaki. You can see they're all similar, but diverging a little bit. And the British themselves use that term, Sukwaki, to name their northernmost village in Massachusetts in the valley, which is today called Northfield. Northfield was known to the British as Squaquig until 1723, when it was renamed Northfield. Squaquig is an English way of pronouncing Sukwaquik, which is a Beneke. They learned that word from the original people, from their own mouths. Now, when you think of the Abenaki people, your average person, you may be thinking in terms of what you're familiar with or what you're unfamiliar with. Often stereotypes come up at these times. This is a painting by a well-known um, artist, Robert Griffin. The clothing here is quite typical for people who were in a warrior position. The landscape looks familiar. This could be the Connecticut River Valley. But this is not all it, it, that there is to the culture. These are human beings. They're doing human things. This is a little closer to what you might see in an everyday situation. Here we have a settlement scene. We have people building a birch bark canoe. We have folks returning from the lake. You can see the canoes out behind them. Their dogs running with them. Dogs were domesticated here. We have homes. I'm sorry, I keep hitting, <laughs> keep hitting the button. Um, we have homes uh, called wigwams made of bark and saplings. We have uh, somebody making a fishing net, um, all kinds of activities. Everybody's helping out here. This is community at work. Everyone does their part. So now coming up the river, I have a red arrow drawn to a point on the Connecticut River. This is a map from the Common Pot by Lisa Brooks, an excellent work, which I also recommend. Um, it discusses the uh, culture and history of this area in a very comprehensive way from an Abenaki point of view. The arrow points to Kitsipontuk. That is the Abenaki name for what is now Bellows Falls. And it is a very significant place to a Beneke people. The falls. We don't have a picture of what it used to look like. All we know is what we see now and a series of things that came before it. At the falls or the rapids, because those, those words are interchangeable in a Beneke, uh, it was, this was the first point bridged on the Connecticut River, the first point on the entire length of the river, right there in Bellows Falls at the Great Falls at Kitsipontuk. Here's the first bridge, the Enoch Hale Bridge, built in 1785. You'll notice the scale's a little bit off. Those horses are kind of huge. We're on the uh, northwestern corner looking back toward Fall Mountain in this, in this uh, illustration. The next bridge was the Tucker Bridge, the Covered Bridge. We're at the southwestern 
bank now, looking north up the river, the water is high here. This is after the canal was built. So we have a high water event. Flooding became epidemic after European colonization with the cutting of the forests and the loss of topsoil. The floods got worse and worse and worse. It's probably what's happening at this point. Uh, May 1st, it's a little late for uh, ice out, but who knows? Um, maybe the winter was tough that year. There's your Tucker Bridge. And now the current bridge built in 1930, which is closed to traffic, as you all know, um, perhaps to be rebuilt soon. There talk, there's talk about that. It's getting louder. And uh, underneath are the rocks and the water. And what used to be the Great Falls. What was the importance of the Great Falls? Well, the immediate draw was the fish. You'll see that in Rockingham's history. Um, Native people would come here on their seasonal rounds to meet the fish, to greet the fish as they came up from the ocean, um, to harvest and to share and to celebrate. Everybody helped. Again, these are uh, contemporary paintings, some of them more accurate than others. Um, the picture to the left with the women and children, that's a pretty good depiction. We can see uh, uh, fish down on the shore and in a basket. There's a fish trap to the left. Baskets uh, woven from natural materials. There's the dog again, looking for a handout. Over to the right, we have uh, men in a canoe. Again, the scales off a little bit and the stereotypical outfits, but fishing from a canoe with spears, also done here. Dip nets were used also. It's a historic photo on the left of uh, a man out on a fishing station with a dip net, catching the fish coming past. This practice is still used. The person on the right is in the Pacific Northwest fishing for salmon, still using a very similar dip net. We don't have salmon here any longer for any number of sad reasons. We do have shad. The shad are not in very good shape up in Vermont. You cannot fish for shad, but to the south, there's a decent shad fishery. So <clears throat> people were here, a lot of people were here for a very long time. We don't have records of that. We know that from archaeology. We know that from some oral history. We have to turn to some degree to written documentation by European settlers, Euro-Americans. Uh, the history of the town of Rockingham by Lyman Hayes is a good reference. You need to read between the lines. Lyman has a lot of good information in there, and you have to extrapolate from it a little bit. I have some quotes on the right side. I'll just read excerpts from them. There is no record of there being any permanent Indian villages or individual families of that race at this early date in this town. And what they're referring to here is the fact that whereas there may have been native people here before, then they all disappeared. That's how the story is told. However, next paragraph. At different points in earlier years were often found articles fashioned either for war or peace. The place most rich of these is on the meadow across the Connecticut where the village of North Walpole lies. Uh, this was evidently once the location of quite an extensive Indian village. So there is an admittance that there were people here and there were a lot of people here. And the final paragraph tradition says that long before the white man came to this vicinity, there was a large Indian village of wigwams from the south end of Mount Kilburn where the station of Cold River now is, a quarter of a mile south stretching, and it was the subtribe of the great Abenakis or Algonquins. This is the terms that was used at the time. They didn't really understand who they were talking about. This is what they had left. From the same book, 
Now the story is starting to change. Oh, they weren't all gone. They didn't all leave. Mm -hmm. They came back because this was an important place. During all the first half of the last century, small parties of the more civilized and peaceable Abenaki Indians, because before this they were bloodthirsty, <laughs> as the story went, used to visit Bellows Falls nearly every summer, every summer coming from their homes in Canada and New York State. So now they're from away. They're not from here. They came down to Connecticut in their canoes. I'll skip ahead. They usually encamped on Pine Hill. You know, Pine Hill, right in the middle of the village, the cemetery up on the top, which was then north of the village. It hadn't grown that much. Sometimes they built their wigwams on the beach south of the falls, sometimes on the Vermont side and others on the New Hampshire side. Uh, a little uh, stereotyping going on here. The men spent much of the time fishing in the river and hunting in the hills and the squaws carried on the mercantile branch of their business. And then we have this wonderful personalized story starting out with the last remnant of this tribe. Um, uh, please note that is not true. The Beneke people are still here. But this particular individual came down to Bellows Falls in 1856 in their birch bark canoes. A chief who was very old and infirm, a young wife and their sons. So they came down and they camped out on the Walpole side near the mouth of Governor's Brook. They built their wigwams in true Indian fashion and uh, the residents enjoyed visiting with them. Later in the season, when the weather grew cold and the party began to return to Canada before the river was frozen, the old chief stayed. He wished to die beside the Great Falls and to be buried with his fathers. Read between the lines here. He wanted to be buried with his fathers. People had been living here, coming here, staying here, and being buried here for generations and generations and generations. This man knew this and he wanted to be here. And I'll get into the reasons why shortly. So his family left and he stayed. And in his last hour, he called his elder son. I'm going to the great spirit, he said. Keep in mind that this is a European account. And then he was buried in what was then the Rockingham Burying Ground, now known as the Old Catholic Cemetery, on the terraces in the west part of the village, heading up the hill. No stone was erected to mark the spot, and the old representative of the proud tribe of Abenakis rests in a grave, the location of which cannot be pointed out. So he's there. His grandfathers are there. They're all still here. We have a similar story up in Springfield um, told by Miss Eva Baker, who was uh, really a good expert on the folklore up in that area. She was talking about the Sagamore, which means chief. Um, Skichawag, you may know Skichawag Mountain up there in Springfield, named after a person or a family. In 1760, he returned from Canada, question mark, and he wanted to die and be buried in the Indian Cemetery in Weathersfield. He lived in the caves known as the Tories Hole and I had a friend named Better Nagoa, as this Better Ganoa, as this is told. Uh, it's interesting to try to translate these names sometimes. Um, it's possible, it's fun. Skichuag generally translates as Great Mountain or Big Mountain. So around 1765, he disappeared and the remains of a man were found on top of the ground in the Indian cemetery. And Better Ganoa was positive that they were the bones of Skichawag. We have another person here returning to be buried with their grandfathers. Why? Well, we have some indications as to why. You've heard of the petroglyphs in Bellows Falls at Kitsipantagak uh, under the bridge. There are only two primary petroglyphs 
sites in what is now Vermont, only two. They are very rare and they are to be noted for that reason. This is an early lithograph kind of a primitive depiction of what was seen there early in the 19th century, early 1800s. These petroglyphs are dated back to perhaps about 3000 years old. So people have been here for a long time and they mark this place as significant. A little more recent picture from the other. Again, you can see there's more there than just faces. Today, you will only see faces, but there was other there, other depictions there at the time, all with different meanings. Another photograph, and again, they look different than the previous. This is 1860 now, when uh, Edward Hitchcock was doing his explorations up and down the valley. The same fellow for whom Hitchcock, Lake Hitchcock was named. Another photograph, changing again. And today, this is what you'll see, a series of um, relatively similar faces. The man looking at them is the Vermont state archeologist, Jess Robinson. Uh, they came down to do a survey a couple of years ago. And um, the faces look like this now because they were recarved in an effort to keep them maintained as a tourist attraction by the Daughters of the American Revolution in the early 1930s. Unfortunately, um, they changed drastically, but they're still there. So why so special? You need to look at the world through a different culture to understand these. These are not just drawings on rock. They are not graffiti. They are not art. They speak to a way of being in the world. Some of those ways, which are shared among many people, is the concept that all things are connected. Everything possesses spirit. There are multiple layered worlds. These worlds can be traversed or crossed. Reality is subjective, not objective. It's all different at the same time with multiple explanations. Not everything is visible. The invisible is just as valid as the, as the visible. Creation is continual. It did not happen once and then unspool from that point forward. It's always happening. Time does not exist. There is only the present. Another word for time is change. We are here now. Somebody was here before us. Someone will come after us. But we're all made of the same stuff. I carry my, grandfa my grandfather and my grandmother inside of me. My children come from me and my grandchildren come from me. All it does is change. And while this changes, spirit is exchanging, it is in motion. And while it's moving back and forth and changing, it can go in one direction or another and we want to seek balance because sometimes chaos happens. Your, uh, your basic scientific laws, entropy occurs. Things tend toward disorder unless you do something about it. And energy and matter are conserved. There's nothing new in this world. It just keeps changing. There's no disagreement between Western science and indigenous knowledge. So in the process here, you see that lots of things are moving. There are lots of actors. There's lots of agency. They are interrelating. It is shifting all the time. And so basically, we are looking at a world of constructed of relationships not objects. And this comes out in the worldview and in the way that one interacts with the world around you. English is a language of nouns. It is 
the language that we use in our world, our everyday world, but it is a language of objectification. We don't think about it because we use it every day. It is about two thirds nouns. It's very good at, at creating value, putting things in boxes, assigning labels, hierarchies, power structures. That's, that's English. The Abenaki language is a language that is about two thirds verbs. It is a language of relationship. It describes what is happening in the moment and that, and that something is constantly changing. So we need to be present in order to participate in a meaningful way and figure out what we need to do to move toward balance. How does this play out at the Great Falls? What do we see here that, that this worldview encompasses, it looks at, it takes it in, and then it responds? Because if you are in a relationship with whatever is around you, it demands a response. Relationships require participation whether it's with your significant other or with the landscape around you. At Kitsi Pontuk, which means, Kitsi meaning great, and Pontuk, Pon is falling, and Tuk is water in dynamic motion. So it describes the great falls. We have that powerful falling water. Water is life. Without water, we would be dead. You have a lot of water and it is moving and that speaks to spirit and energy and change and creation. Under the water, we have whirlpools. The great eddy itself, the smaller whirlpools in the channel. Whirlpools, again, are motion embodied. They spiral and they are considered portals to other worlds. It is a place where things are changing and transitioning. We have a steep mountain across the water, Fall Mountain. That, that suggests the, the world of the earth, the surface there. We have the surface of the earth. We have the water. We have the entrance into the underworld. And we have the sky above, all of these worlds coming together. The spring fish runs come to this place. The fish are our relatives. They come to see us, we go to see them. They are a gift from creation. Happening in a cycle. Every year, this happens. Things that we can count upon. Above, you have birds of prey. Again, creatures of the sky. Another world. Eagles. Peregrine falcons are nesting at the bridge right now. Vultures. Messengers, birds are messengers. They are present. Rattlesnakes. Perhaps not now, but historically there were rattlesnakes at Fall Mountain. Rattlesnakes are again, creatures of transition. They move, excuse me, my dog is barking. <laughs> um, they, they move between the upper world and the underworld. Snakes are not considered to be a bad thing. They are recognized as being very important transitional creatures. They have great power as well. In Bellows Falls, there are thermal springs. There is warm water coming out of the ground. That is a very unusual circumstance in this area. Again, transition between worlds coming from below up to us. Traditions. People have been coming here for a long time, learning things, sharing things. We want to honor these traditions. Traditions last because they are worthwhile. They hold life lessons. They are sustainable, and we would do well to pay attention to them. Many traditional travel routes came through this area, both the river itself and on land. People converged upon this place. It's no accident that the first bridge was built here because colonists would build on top of indigenous civilizations. The best places are always the best places, always have been, always will be. 
And if your ancestors have been coming here for a long time, you want to honor them, you want to be with them, you want to be buried with your grandfathers because you come from them. You want to honor them in a very literal sense. They are there. You go to visit them. They never left completely. And they have turned into you. You're the same thing. And you want to honor those beginnings. Uh, Bells Falls is well known for having burials all around, across the island and up onto the terraces to the west. Many, many, many uh, human remains have been exhumed and seemingly disappeared. Uh, we don't know where they went. Um, we'd like there to be a little more awareness about that. So native people continue to visit and inhabit this place. I wrote palace, excuse me. It is a palace. We'll go with it. And the nearby regions in order to maintain these established relationships. If you have a relationship, you have to have some input. You got to work on it. Um, this is a responsibility. We can see that in our own lives. But our responsibilities tend to be a little more narrowly focused nowadays. We need to broaden our vision because this narrow focus is indicative of the way that the planet as a whole is trending. We need to come back into relationship with each other and with place. We do not own the land. The land owns us. Because of that, we say, we are grateful. When I say, if I break this down and translate it, I am actually saying, I am in the normal way. That is what this means. To not be grateful is to not be on the bus. You need to recognize that we are gifted with everything that is around us, and we need to be grateful. That's all there, all there is to it. So I'm going to say, Wuliwuni Nidombak, thank you, my friends. Um, if you want more information, you can go to atui.org. Um, you can go to the Elnu Abeniki website as well. Um, my community here in what is now southeastern Vermont. And uh, that's what the website looks like, Atui. Atui is a Western Abeniki word that means together in space and time. And it describes the situation we find ourselves in right now. We're all here now. All of the stories that have ever happened are still here. It's our responsibility to learn them and to figure out how to be together in a good way. Because many of the things that have happened here in the past were not in a good way. And uh, we can do better. So I want to thank you for listening to this. And we can take some questions. We have a lot of folks on the on the screen here, so if you uh, have a question and want to uh, uh, put the little uh, symbol on the screen that you to raise your hand or put it in the chat, we will try to um, uh, try to find you and 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 permit you to speak up. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I'm just curious um, with these uh, Abenakis who came down from the north in the summer, I think said the last time was in 1856. Were these Abenakis living there and then were pushed north by the white men? Or was this something that they just plain knew about from previous generations or what? What was it about? <laughs> sure. Um, I think we can we can see from the story, you know, obviously extrapolating a little bit, but it's pretty clear that the person wished to be buried with their fathers. So the family lines had direct connections to that place. They had been there for a long, long time. 
they had been temporarily displaced, many Abenaki did move north. It doesn't specify what they meant by north. They may have only been 50 miles up the river. They may have been 120 miles up the river. They may have been in Quebec at St. Francis, which is still an Abenaki community, a large Abenaki community known as Udenak, which means the village. Uh, many, many native folks from all across Northern New England ended up at Udenak some of them from the Connecticut River Valley, the Sokoki, some of them Abenaki from further east and other tribes. But they would come back to their original homelands where their families were from. Not everyone left, not everyone went to St. Francis, to Odenak, but many are still there and many are still here. Thank you. Um, Fran Putnam. Yes, I have a question. Um, I live on the other side of Vermont in on Otter Creek um, and at the bottom of the falls. And I'm wondering if there are places like the Great Falls on my side of Vermont, uh, up and down the Otter Creek River, and also if there are other places that are important sites up and down the Connecticut River, other than the, the site that we were talking about today. Uh, that's a good question. Um, are you at the Middlebury Falls or the one in Virgins? Um, I'm I'm in uh, in Weybridge, so I'm I'm the second falls below Middlebury or above Middlebury. Okay. And and I we had some archaeological work done uh, because of the uh, power line was uh, was be moved and so they had some archaeology done there and they told us that it was where we were was probably a site for uh, like a camping site for fishing and so on very similar to what you showed but I'm just curious if this has been researched up and down uh, other parts of Vermont and if I might be in one of those places. Well I think it, I think it could be observed that any place where there is a falls a significant falls is going to be a regular gathering place because of the resources, because of the degree of spiritual power that is perceived there. So any falls is important. Some are considered more significant than others. Um, the, the bigger the falls, the more important. Um, what is now Bellows Falls, Kitsipontaguk, is the largest drop on the Connecticut River. So it is the biggest falls. Um, there is another great falls down the river at Montague. Um, also called Great Falls, today called Turner's Falls, a name that I do not like to use because of who it honors, but also a very significant place. Um, the presence of petroglyphs tells us that it's especially significant. I am not going to get into a big explanation of what the petroglyphs are all about. That is uh, uh, some knowledge that is not always shared openly. And um, it's a very long and involved story. So um, maybe another day and maybe not. <laughs> but uh, suffice it to say that they tell us that this is um, a place where we need to be paying attention. Uh, I'm going to turn to Walter here who has his hand in the air. Electronically. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Um, I'm curious about the two. I, I, I have two questions. The first one is um, I heard you say that there were, uh, that there is another set of petroglyphs somewhere in Vermont. Can you uh, help us understand where that's located and if there's any relationship between that set of petroglyphs and the ones that we have here in Bellows Falls? Um, thank you, Walter. The other primary um, area that has petroglyphs is down here where I live in Wontostagok, uh, Brattleboro. Um, placed for similar reasons, um, uh, giving us similar indications as to the significance of the area. Um, the, the petroglyphs here in Brattleboro are no longer visible because they are 
covered by the water level raised by building of the Vernon Dam 10 miles downriver uh, in 1909. They are still there. They have been relocated by Annette Spaulding, who some of you may know, um, a well-known area professional diver. And uh, they're, there, they're there doing what they were intended to do, um, sharing their message to the place. And uh, that's, and that's uh, not that far away from Bellis Falls. Mm -hmm. And for similar reasons, by similar people, um, doing, meeting their responsibilities to that place. Mm -hmm. uh, my second question has to do with the Bellows Falls petroglyphs themselves. Um, it's my understanding that uh, there are some of the petroglyphs that were not um, restored. I'll put quotation marks around that, that DAR effort uh, uh, to conserve the uh, petroglyphs by having a carver etch them in a little deeper because they were starting to fade away. I've seen some pictures of some smaller petroglyphs that are off to the side of that main group that you were bringing attention to. They're very faint. They've not been oftentimes a little bit smaller and they also seem to go off. And I'm wondering if there may be some that have been covered over by construction rubble as I think you pointed out with uh, the building of the bridge or bridges that spanned uh, the falls at that point, uh, what's now the Vilas Bridge, that over the years when Euro-Americans were developing the bridges, doing other development projects that they may have dumped riprap or they may have dumped uh, rock uh, left over from excavation as they were building. Are there any others that are off on the side that are hidden perhaps under uh, stone? What is your understanding of that? Um, yes, Walter, um, exactly. The, it, it does seem that below the recarved petroglyphs that we see clearly, uh, there are others that are covered. They're obscured, uh, they're heavily eroded. Um, you saw that photograph of the high water underneath the Tucker Bridge. Mm -hmm. that, that water occasionally goes right over the petroglyphs and we know that water erodes over mm -hmm. time. And if, if these uh, messages have been placed there in the stone for thousands of years and they have, they're going through erosion. They are going through change. Change is normal. Change is continual. It's okay. We don't need to recarve them. They're doing what they're supposed to do in the way that they are supposed to. But um, there probably are some other carvings below there. They are relatively protected at the moment. Um, the site has not been treated well. Uh, I, it's been disrespected greatly. Maybe something can be done about that someday. Um, this is um, an expression of a spiritual interaction with place. And it would be, uh, you know, akin to going in and trashing somebody's altar in their church. Thank you for the answer. John, can you hear me? Which John are you referring to? Letman. Can, can you hear me? John, you're muted. John Lettman, you're muted. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, Dwayne, I think you're next. And there are others with hands in the air, so please hang in there. Dwayne, please unmute. And you're... <clears throat> Early presentation, you showed the archaeological site. What artifacts that they found over the years, where are they located currently? I, I, I can't say for sure, but I know that after an archaeological dig, the um, material that is recovered 
is taken into a laboratory for analysis and that analysis and those reports can often take years. So I imagine that they are still in a laboratory somewhere. Dr. Really? Bob, Doc, okay. Dr. Bob Goodby could answer that question. I didn't know if they, I, I mean, I don't know if it was uh, a, a university involved or a place like uh, Concord, New Hampshire, where there's um, historical sites of, inform of uh, pl things from this archaeological dig. I didn't know if there was some museum somewhere. That's why I asked that. I, I do know, Duane, that some of the um, material, that cultural material that was recovered is exhibited at Keene Middle School. Okay. Um, as an educational resource for the community there um, the, and the students as they learn more about the world that they're living in, a more complete story. The second question I have has to do with the petroglyphs. They are located on the Vermont side, the western side of the Connecticut River. Does that have any significance of where they're located versus the eastern side of the river? Uh, Yes, I, I would say yes. Um, the, the presence on the west side, primarily on the west side, there's no ruling out the fact that there aren't others in other places, but they may not be documented or they may have been destroyed uh, due to past practices. But on the west side is a, um, a not uncommon occurrence um, relative to, to what the messages are that they are embodying. Um, the west side being where souls go um, at passing. And so they are looking west. We have a similar situation down here in Brattleboro where the, the single face of which I am aware uh, is also facing directly west. Okay, very good, thank you. Okay, uh, I'm going to take Tina next. Uh, just a comment and then a question, Rich. Um, I thought it was very interesting you had uh, the pages from the town of Rockingham history. And I dare say that most 19th century, early 20th century histories have similar statements about uh, the last Indian or uh, Indian woman who was in town. Um, I think that the challenge for uh, local communities is to recognize that uh, Native people um, became acculturated very early and intermarried with settlers and that uh, their descendants are still here, uh, never left Vermont. And uh, that is something we need to reckon with. And uh, it certainly uh, belies the, the kind of uh, history that was taught in the schools about indigenous people leaving the land. Now, my question to you, uh, Rich, I know you're not a resident of Rockingham, but you are a resident of the region and the, and the Connecticut Valley. And if you had your druthers, what would you like to see happen uh, at the falls, at the site of the falls? <laughs> that's, a, <laughs> that's a big question. Um, I would like to see um, a, a great measure of respect um, bestowed upon that place. I would like to see it cleaned up. I would like to see access um, improved for those who would like to visit for ceremony. Uh, I would like there to be uh, uh, an awareness uh, within the village of, of what it actually means and what it can mean. Uh, I think it can be an enriching experience for the entire community. At the same time, I don't think it should be turned into a tourist attraction. Um, it needs to be treated um, and acknowledged with the respect it deserves. Um, I, I, I'll just add that, although that might be an aspiration, it is an aspiration and I just shared with others, um, for which I am grateful also, perhaps something will happen. The, uh, the land is controlled by the power company and they do not 
give up uh, anything easily. And it is difficult to get to due to the construction that has happened there in terms of the bridge nearby and the retaining wall and the road and the railroad siding immediately above. So um, it's a great challenge, but we have to start by raising awareness and understanding because you don't care about what you don't know about. Very true. Uh, Tony. Yeah, hey, hello, my name is Tony. I'm uh, Dene from New Mexico. Um, and I guess I just wanted to ask with the connection with the land um, and the idea of balance, uh, what is uh, some ways that you see that reflected in nature, like to achieve balance, to achieve that as we walk through the journey, as we walk the red path, as we fight for land back, you know, how do we, how can we use nature as an example for ourselves, at least in your own way of thinking? Why, Tony. Um, Willie Winnie, thank you for your question. Um, it's a very good question. It's at the heart of the matter. Uh, I, I, th I think it's, it's in how you, how you approach it, how you place yourself in that equation. Um, in, in the Abenaki language, there is no word for nature. Um, that is a binary. It is not something that we can name as separate from ourselves. We are a part of this creation. And so um, when we put ourselves on that circle of relationship, instead of in the center or on a line or a pyramid, we put ourselves on the circle and we're looking around that circle and we see everything else equally. We see them, and I say them, those someones, as people, as, as equals, as having spirit. We recognize that and then it, it requires that we behave ourselves differently when we see them as the same as us. Okay. When I look at a tree, it's a someone. And that comes out in the language. It does not come out in the English language, but in the Abenaki right. language, when I look at a tree, I say, Awani na abazi. Who is that tree? It is a someone. Okay. And to the degree that we begin to live that way mm -hmm. in a reciprocal relationship, boy, everything will change. Oh, oh. I see it. Thank you. What do you need, Rich? Thank you. Um, I have Alice May's trust on the written on the uh, screen, but I guess that's Sarah. <laughs> you know that, John. Aloha and greetings, everybody. It's uh, so wonderful that we're all here together and bringing light, um, rich blessings, and beautiful um, to have joined tonight. And it's really warming my heart. I'm uh, new to the Vermont area and um, finding great joy in um, being able to connect with um, First Nations and place here and honoring that. My question, Rich, is I had heard you speak uh, I think it was a month and a half ago um, on another Zoom about Vermont's place names being eradicated um, quite substantially compared to other uh, locations around uh, New England and quote unquote states, these separations of our motherland. Um, and I was fascinated by that, um, wondering and, and questioning how that was done so efficiently here by the, the people that came in and took away the place name so effectively. And I was wondering if you can enlighten me and others on how that was done and why it was so effective here in, in the land that's called Vermont. 
Cert <clears throat> Excuse me. Certainly, that's a very good question. Um, I can offer a couple of observations about that. Of the of the states in the Northeast that are now called New England, uh, the six states, the one that was settled last was Vermont. All of the other uh, Northeastern states were settled to some degree or another before Vermont was. Vermont was uh, held back from settlement uh, essentially until the end of the French and Indian War, the last French and Indian War. And then the floodgates broke and the settlers came in um, effectively around 1760. There were some settlers here slightly earlier, but they tended to come and go because it was not safe to be here. It was contested territory. Um, one way of looking at things was that there were a series of five Anglo-Wabanaki wars fought in this valley. The Abenaki never surrendered. Those wars went on for about 100 years. And those are the stories we hear about settlers being kidnapped, killed, carried off or pushed away. And the Abenaki almost uniquely among the other tribes in New England were allied with the French always to the north. That was their place of refuge. That was their safe place. That's where they were supported. And so if they needed to move back during these conflicts, they went north and many people are still there. Not everyone did, but when the British came in, when the British won the war of empire and they flooded into Vermont, into formerly French held and controlled territory, they did not see a lot of opposition because the Abenaki were allied with the French and they were going where it was safe or they were going out of sight. And so there was a wholesale renaming of the landscape and naming is a way of claiming. So these other names were taken away. English names were put on top using very different practices, using that English language of object objectification, naming places after famous people, other towns, um, all kinds of random things that had nothing to do with the landscape but that's what English people do. Uh, and so here in Vermont, we have only a very, very small handful of native names left on the landscape. Um, you could almost name them on one hand or two hands. Winooski, uh, Ascutney, uh, Wontosticate across the river here uh, in Brattleboro and a couple others, very, very few. Whereas in other places where there was interaction with native peoples for a long, long period of time, um, those names have stuck. The settlers knew those places by those names and they adopted them. Not so here. And that is a, a historical fact based on colonization, basically, and war. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Might I add one piece to that, which is that in this part of New England, we do not have the documents which purported to uh, show the, the granting of land from indigenous people to the English settlers for the reasons that you just described quite well. Uh, many other places in New England and elsewhere in the country have these documents. They were written in the language of the English settlers, but they purported to create a, uh, a, a baseline of land ownership uh, from which lineages of land ownership have continued. And that we, we don't have those, those Indian deeds hanging on the walls of our town halls here in uh, for for the for the reasons uh, that that you that you explain and and this this of course then uh, accentuated the erasure of 
the culture that had been here. Am I stating that reasonably correctly? I would say so. Yes. Um, yeah, the legal the legal uh, landscape here is very, very different as well. Um, for for the most part, almost completely, none of the land here was ever deeded or ceded or subject to treaties. Yeah. It was all just simply taken. Can I call on uh, John Tribuna? Thank you. Um, I wanted to thank you, Rich, for this, this great and insightful presentation you're giving. And um, I had a que I have a question. I um, studied American history at university, and I've always been interested in Native American uh, uh, history, having grown up in the land of the, the, the Wampanoag. Please excuse my pronunciation. I've never heard it that stated. Um, said aloud um, on the South Shore of Boston. And what my understanding growing up uh, has been that uh, the perception of European settlers as to, uh, you know, the virgin lands that they were encountering uh, was a misunderstanding of how the native populations related to the land. For example, south of Boston, um, the people would, um, uh, would would live in the Blue Hills during the winter and then spend the warmer months on the shores of Boston Harbor and the the, the island um, using the different seasonal uh, seasons for the different uh, resources. And a measure of how long they have been there and still are there has been, uh, for example, the, the size of the uh, shellfish min, which many people mistake for uh, natural formation with when they were actually the hills created over the thousands of years in which uh, the, 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 the people, um, you know, farm the oceans and, and live in those areas. So I just uh, wonder if you have any uh, comments as to how these misperception, cultural misperceptions of the use of land um, has played into the history. Thank you. Sure, that's a, that's a big question. I'll try to touch on that quickly. Um, yes, very different ways of perceiving um, a relationship with land as a, um, English settlers and many Europeans approaching it from, a, from an ownership standpoint. Um, the, the, that results from an anthropocentric point of view where people are the most important thing, hands down. Um, as we already discussed, they are not. They are on a circle of creation and everything else is just as important. So you can't own something else. You cannot. The only thing you can own is something that you have made yourself, such as your clothes or your body ornament or your house. Um, but all of those are gifts coming from somewhere else as well. The, uh, the Abeniki have a concept um, of ownership in that uh, the, the entity that is called variously Kitsinawask or a great spirit, the word used for that, that entity is also tabledoc, which means the owner. That is the only one that owns anything, the owner. And we are all the beneficiaries of that owner. And it is only the owner who can decide what to do with things. It's not up to us. Now, property rights are the exact opposite. I found out something quite remarkable the other day when I was researching this. Uh, American property rights, Western property rights derive from Roman law, right? Western civilization, it all just comes down the pike and we, uh, we inherit that and we build upon it and it gets more and more complicated. So Roman law is based on three concepts of ownership of, of uh, packages of rights. The first one is called um, uses, um, the right to use the land. Uh, we can all agree that we all have a right to use the land, to, 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 to use what we need and no more. The second bundle, uh, second uh, component of that bundle of rights is uh, fructus. And that is the right to use the fruits of the land, what the land produces. And together you put those, you put those together and you have what's called usufruct, which is a term still in use and is what is assigned to native people. They have the right to use the land and have the fruit of the land, but no more. Nothing past that point. 
the third part of the of the bundle of property rights that we use and embrace from Roman law is called abusus. It is the right to destroy the land. This is what we have taken upon ourselves. Usus, fructus, and abusus. We are in charge. We can decide what to do. This same thing applies to slavery, to people, to animals. We have made ourselves the owner. Only the owner has that right but we've taken it upon ourselves. And so if you charge into a country with these assumptions, things are going to go a certain way. And if the people in that place do not think the same way, it's not going to go well. Thank you. Well said. <laughs> um, I've one further hand and there are some questions on the chat so i'm trying to make sure that we are covering what we can um and perhaps somebody knows better than i do how long we uh, can stay on the thing here well uh can i call on dunham dunham rowley is the uh, name on the thing yes thanks um rich a wonderful presentation i really appreciate it um, I was just wondering what other what other ethnicities uh, may have also used and traversed uh, the the area where the um, the Abenaki reside and have occupied. Do you have any sense of of um, the people who may have also shared the land with the Abenaki? That's a good question. Um, now, nothing is simple. Everything is complex. The Connecticut River being the largest river in the Northeast, the Great River, um, it was a well-traveled highway for people. Um, so anyone to the point to points south would be traveling up the Connecticut River to go to points north or to visit and trade here. All of the people, native peoples in the Northeast were Algonquian speaking peoples. And so they could communicate with each other to some degree. Um, so there was a lot of trade and a lot of travel going on. And likewise, people to the north would travel south down the river. There, were, there was the water itself as a uh, travel route and there were trails on either side of it and branching off, but it was the central artery. Um, so any, any and all of those people uh, to the west were Ir Iroquoian speaking people, a very different language group, and often at great odds with the Algonquian people. Uh, I think of the Mohawk Trail to the south of Vermont, Route 2 in Vermont, uh, in Massachusetts. Um, it is not the Mohawk Trail. It was named thus by the Department of Transportation in the state of Massachusetts around 1913 when they were developing auto routes for tourists. Why the Mohawk Trail? The British were always aligned with the Mohawk. The Mohawk did travel over here, not on friendly terms, but they're the ones who are remembered by the name of that road. That, uh, that trail system, that was an Algonquian trail for, for millennia. And so, you know, the victor gets to call the shots. In the um, chat, there uh, is a little bit of back and forth about the, uh, which I, I, I think I'm reasonably well representing that uh, a few folks have raised questions about the uh, sort of genealogical history of the folks who are now in our indigenous communities in Vermont. Um, there's complexity there. Uh, there are whole issues, of course, about the way in which Native Americans have been uh, expected to be full blood while um, English Americans uh, make a big deal about the fact that one of their ancestors in 1620 came on the Mayflower uh, to create 
kind of a uh, controversy there. Um, but perhaps you can say a little bit about who, who's here now and uh, what traditions uh, does that represent? Certainly. Is that a reasonable question? Sure. Um, that is something that, that is talked about and it is complex. Um, the Abenaki people here in Vermont today are descendants of Abenaki people of other nations and of other grandmothers and grandfathers. I myself being one of them, uh, one, of those, one of those people. My folks come from all over the place, including from this continent. And I think that's true of everyone. I mean, as you just pointed out, John, um, the Mayflower Society, uh, that's a long time ago. If you want to go back that far, you're looking at about 10, 11 generations, 12 generations even. Um, but it still matters. Even 14. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I cannot make such a claim. Um, but the, the people that are, are here now and, and recognition is a political process that we need to navigate in today's world. I was listening to a Wampanoag friend speak just two days ago. Uh, he is a member of the Gayhead Aquina tribe of Wampanoag who were only recognized by the federal government in 1987. These are the same people who met the well-known pilgrims, formerly mentioned, um, but only achieved federal recognition in 1987, not because they wanted to, they had every right to, but they recognized that they needed to do this in order to protect their homelands for their grandchildren. They're from Martha's Vineyard. That's what Aquina is, where Aquina and Gayhead is. Noip in their name, in their language. And you can't live on Martha's Vineyard uh, unless you got the moolah. <laughs> but if that's your homeland and you'd like to stay there, and have your children stay there. You need to take some measures and federal recognition can give you that. Not everyone can get federal recognition. Some states have a state recognition process. Not everyone is recognized at all. It all depends on what you need to do to survive where you are. And that is the case here. It sounds, if I may, Rich, what I just heard you reference, what you just said, uh, brings to mind uh, this notion of firsting and lasting. That if you look at New England town histories, there's the first and then there's the last, the last of the uh, Abnaki, the first of uh, the church, that, that, that there are very um, different way, very Euro, centric ways of understanding the imposition, if you will, of a, Euro, of a European, of a Western culture uh, on top of uh, the cultures and the human societies that were here. Anyway. Yeah, these are all manifestations of um, racism, of racializing, I should say, racializing. Uh, different rules for different people, depending on who's making the rules up and what they decide uh, they're trying to achieve. If you are African American in this country, there's a rule called the one drop rule that applied to you. If you had one drop of ancestry um, down that line, you were African American, you were black. However, on the other hand, if you didn't have enough native blood, you didn't count. And so you could be phased out of federal programs. You weren't Indian enough. And this, this plays out with all different people, depending on who's making the rules. By that rule, I'm black. By some people's rules, I'm not Indian. I don't go by those rules. I am a human being. I am Al Numba. I am a member of a state recognized tribe, a citizen here in Vermont. 
my grandmothers and my grandmothers come from all over the world. And I am grateful to be here with you and you are my family too. And to the degree that we begin to act like that, we will have a better world. Uh, Dwayne, you have your hand in the air or were you just agreeing? <laughs> Unmute yourself. I think there was, that was just me giving a thumbs up, maybe. Okay, now Dwayne had his hand in the air, I think, but uh, is muted. Mm -hmm. Line off. Uh, okay. My question is, um, is Swarton the place where the Abernakis have a museum and or library? And can people visit them? After that place to get information and, and see if they have a museum to see the museum? A good question, Dwayne. Um, my, I, now someone can correct me perhaps, but my um, understanding is that currently uh, in Swanton with the Missisquoi Band of Abenaki, there is a tribal headquarters. I don't believe there is an active museum there right now, but there is a tribal headquarters you can go there and visit if public health regulations are allowing at the moment. There are uh, museums elsewhere in the state. Um, the, the state of Vermont maintains an exhibit at, at uh, Crown Point, um, a chimney, chimney Point, I should say. Um, also at Barry in Barry at the um, Historical Society and at the Archaeological Center. And there is a relatively new and very good um, place to visit in Winooski at the Ethan Allen Homestead uh, with a group called Alnombaiwi. Alnombaiwi is an Abenaki word that means in the Abenaki way. And I recommend that. In conjunction with what you just outlined, is there also a, a, either a museum or library at St. Francis in Canada? Oh, certainly. Oh, certainly. There is a wonderful museum there at the uh, at Udenak, at the former St. Francis Mission, the Abenaki Museum. Check it out. To your knowledge, has there ever been an oral history uh, activity done in the past to hear stories from the, the older people of Abenakis, an oral history done? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, there's been quite a bit of that work done. Um, it can be difficult to track down. Um, it's kind of an esoteric subject, but here in Vermont, the Vermont Folklife Center has done some of that work. Um, various um, uh, researchers have done that at Udenak, collecting stories. Um, here in Vermont, that has happened as well. And it's ongoing. To your knowledge, has any of them been published? Any oral histories been published to your knowledge? I don't have that information at the top of my mind. Where would I go to, to seek that out? Do you have any um, suggestions of where I might go to find out what oral histories might have been published? Well, okay, now my brain's starting to fire. Uh, <laughs> There, there are a number of, uh, of books authored by uh, uh, the Bruchak family, which have quite a bit in them. Um, I recommend you check them out under, uh, under the author B-R-U-C-H-A-C, Bruchak. Um, any number of titles there. Um, there are some more academic textual works, uh, one called The Original Vermonters and another one called The Western Abenaki. Uh, Western Abenaki is written by Colin Calloway, who is a history professor at Dartmouth. And Original Vermonters is written by uh, Hallowell and Powers, who were on faculty at UVM. Um, and they're more of a, a, an academic uh, exploration. Uh, in terms of traditional stories, um, you're going to do better with the Bruchaks. Um, and that's what comes to mind at the moment. Okay, been very helpful. Thank you. Um, June, uh, you've had your hand 
electronically in the air. And unfortunately, it didn't show up very well on my screen, but you're here. So you're next. Um, so my question is about, uh, I recently moved here from near the Nalhegan River and moved back to this area. And I'm wondering about the relationship between the Atawi and Elenu groups, clans, I don't know, I don't know I what it is, and, and the Nisiskoi and, 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 okay. and Elhegan clans. Sure, um, yeah, to clear up any uh, misunderstanding or confusion there, there are, there are four state recognized groups currently in what is now the state of Vermont. This is a process that came into being in 2010, only 12 years ago. The state of Vermont um, enshrined in statute a means to, well, they, they admitted that the Abenaki are the original people of the place. That was a big deal um, after a long time of denying that. And uh, in 2010, they created a recognition mechanism, which was rigorous based upon the federal system. And four bands are now recognized and they are the Missisquoi band primarily at Swanton, Swanton area, Swanton Highgate. Uh, the Nulhegan band uh, named after the Nulhegan River in the Northeast. The uh, Coasec, one of the Coasec bands, which is in the Coas area on the mid Connecticut River. Newberry Haverhill, and the El New Band, which is in southeastern Vermont, uh, where we are. Um, these are four state recognized, politically recognized groups. Not everyone is a member of one of these groups. Some people choose not to be. Mm -hmm. uh, Atui um, is a nonprofit that I direct with Melody. And we are here for cultural outreach purposes. We are, we are uh, El New citizens, so we are most closely uh, connected to El New. Um, the chief and his wife live in Jamaica. Um, Linda is here with us tonight. I saw her on the screen, Linda Sheehan. Um, Sogmosqua. And... Uh, Atui is in the same area, so we work with El Nu, and that is our tribe. But we are here to serve all of the communities at, to the degree possible. Thank you. Are there other uh, questions? There is quite a lot in the chat, which I presume is being recorded so that uh, is being preserved so that uh, it'll go with the recording. There are lots of comments there. Would anybody like, else like to speak up? This has been a tremendously stimulating discussion. I think it has given all of us really a new vision and hopefully some new vocabulary to be thinking about the place that we have the uh, good fortune to inhabit. Looks like Tina has her hand up. Tina? Yeah, I just wanted to thank the Historical Society for uh, hosting this and to do it by Zoom so some of us who live in other parts of Vermont could uh, listen in. I think it's a, a, Rich, you did a fabulous job and I really hope you get invitations to talk in other parts of the state because even if uh, there isn't a specific historic site as rich as, as Bellows Falls, uh, I think that everybody should hear what you have to say and, and uh, be able to discuss it in their community about ways they can better recognize the first people of this place. Willie Winnie, Tina. Any 
anything else before we leave for the evening? I'm going to give you a little uh, five second um, Abenaki language lesson, but I don't need to push this too hard because you already know this word. Everyone speaks this Abenaki word almost every day, and that is the word for yes, and it is uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> so have you ever said that? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> there you go. Now you're now you're talking. Now is there a relationship between that and the classic Vermont term a yeah? <laughs> you're gonna have to research that, John. <laughs> That's from East Anglia, I believe. <laughs> I think it is. Thanks to everybody for being here and for participating and for asking great questions and uh, your face sharing here. Yes.